night, Thursday night viewers, and welcome to the premiere of Let's Talk. I am your host, John Mencius. Today makes 34 days to the ICJ referendum, scheduled to be held on April 10th, 2019. Our historic date with destiny is fast approaching. And in lockstep, the quarreling and fighting and manipulation has been intensifying. And the unfortunate losers in all this is all of us who want to make the best choice for our beliefs. So we are here to deal with the actual issues. No quarreling, no fighting, let's talk. Joining us tonight is Ambassador Alexis Rosado. Ambassador, you are Belize's ambassador to the Republic of Guatemala and non-resident ambassador to the rest of Central America. I understand that you also head the International Boundaries Unit in the Foreign Ministry and serve as co-chair of the Belize-Guatemala Joint Commission. You were formerly CEO in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade before you sure. took up your posting in Guatemala. Earlier in your career, you represented Belize in several posts, I understand, including as High Commissioner for Belize to the United Kingdom and as Belize's Ambassador to the European Commission and European Union, as well as to the WTO, World Trade Organization. So, you're a highly qualified Belizean. You're an SHC alumnus from my own hometown of San Ignacio, Santa Elena, with an MA in International and Comparative Legal Studies from the University of London and uh, you possess a graduate level diplomatic and foreign service studies um, diploma from the Oxford University in the UK. In short, you are an expert in these matters and that is why you're here with us tonight. So Ambassador, I will start off by going straight to a burning question from the man on the street, so to speak. What is the urgency in settling this Belize Guatemala dispute? John, first of all, thank you for having me here and good night to all your viewers. What is the urgency? The urgency is that we have been dealing with this thing for decades, for generations. From the 1930s, we've been dealing with the Guatemalan claim and nobody has been able to solve it. We have gone full circle to where we started off when the problem began. The British told the Guatemalans, let's go to the permanent court of international justice to solve this problem. In the 1930s, in the 1940s, in the 1950s, it was on the table. Guatemala flatly rejected the proposal to solve this problem on the basis of international law. But, but Ambassador, sorry. So we have been waiting for so, too long. But let me put some context to this, again, from the perspective of the man on the street. Um, we have been living alongside Guatemala for, what, 200 years now. Um, they got their independence in 1821. It's, what, 2018. Um, they have never invaded us except for the shenanigans uh, um, on the Sarstoon um, lately. And this has only been, what, over the past two, three years. We trade with them. We exchange with them. Their children go to our primary schools over in Benke. We go to their university. Um, we procure medical services from Guatemala. Um, There's a lot of trade what, going on. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. um, why put us, and this is the man on the street perspective, why put us in a situation where if we, say, go to the ICJ, we can potentially, mm. um, this is one point of view, lose land and sea at least some. Um, and why do that when, as time has shown, we have lived alongside them for 160 years? Um, well, again, it, uh, what is the urgency? It's interesting how we could just quickly brush off history. Um, I grew up part of my childhood in San Ignacio, as you did, right. and many of us <clears> from the West and South um, would remember the many times we had this threat of invasion. That is part of our history that some of us might not recall, 
or we weren't around at the time. But I remember even living in Corazon. One time when we were flooded with people who were coming from the West and South, looking for a place to stay because they were afraid that we were going to get invaded. Our family was one of and, those. And those threats were real. That is why the British had their troops in Belize, and they did not leave until 1993, 1994. So it's not that we have not had a problem with our neighbors. We have had a problem ever since Guatemala tore up the 1859 treaty. And since the British left in 1993, the problems along the border have gotten worse. <coughs> so we talk about the Chiquibul. Problems don't occur there only when you hear it on Channel 5 or Channel 7 or in the newspapers. How much uh, um, has it been estimated that we are losing um, Well, the, the estimates, about 18 the estimates for example, in 2015, FCD, French for Conservation and Development, conducted a study on the loss we've had on logwood, for example, hardwood. Right. And the air calculation was that we had lost about $18 million. Chate cultivation in one year, 2015, um, alone, we lost about six million dollars U.S. Um, that does not include the gold panning that is taking place every day. Does not include the loss of biodiversity, and there's so much other losses that occur. But every isn't day. the problem maybe again that the man on the street isn't seeing this? Well, again, the man they do who... hear it. They do hear it on the news, and people blow it up. And and we have to be careful when I say these things too. That it is not just that we are seeking to take a defensive measure on this whole thing. Bear in mind this has too, and we did not mention that. But we're also looking at a positive way of dealing with our neighbor. You mentioned trade, you mentioned investment, you mentioned cooperation, you mentioned education and so forth. We need to do more of that. We have a whole region south of us, west and south, beyond Guatemala. Guatemala alone is a huge country compared to, in terms of population, for example, and even territory. But beyond Guatemala, you have El Salvador, Honduras that want to trade with so, us. So what you're saying, um, reaching a judicial settlement will establish some kind of baseline from which we can move ahead. We could leap, we can leap neighbor. much further ahead. So, so, so Ambassador, you are not a, a proponent, I, I I assume, of, of, of this um, view of procrastination, um, deep freezing the dispute, so to speak. Um, because as I said, the, the view is that we have been able to get along. There's a modus vivendi going on. Um, it you has know, not been you, all... You, you know, it's interesting that you say that because for a long time, we were trying to solve this problem because it affects us every day. It's not because Guatemala wants to solve the problem. The, the truth of the matter is that this problem affects us more than it does Guatemala. We need, in order to trade with Central America, we need to have better relations with Guatemala. Simple as that. Um, in order for us to be able to feel more secure in order for us to not be harassed in the south and the south too, and in order for us to be able to better protect our border, we okay. need to have a neighbor upon, on whom we can depend. So this brings me to a point that actually I have been making in various forums that one of the problems I think with this binary proposition of yes or no to the ICJ mm -hmm. is that the no side, and when I say the no side, the no side of the proposition, mm -hmm. also means yes to something else. Um, and I think that has caused a lot of confusion because what has been happening is that what is on the table, as it were, is go to the ICJ. Right. And basically what people have been doing is looking at it and say these are the risks and poking holes at it. Right. But let me give an example of, 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 of a problem analogy. I, for example, let's say I have, to, I have to make a trip to Miami. And I give this example because I am an anxious flyer. So the proposition to me, the binary proposition to me is go by plane or not. 
or go by air or not. And when I look at it like that, I start to consider all the problems that comes up in the mind of an anxious flyer like me. Oh, the pilot might be drunk. Um, <laughs> the, the, you know, the you engineers think might of get worst the, case right. Uh, I will think of the worst case. And thinking of it that way, I might say, OK, no, you know, I am not going by air. But let me look at the options then, because I have to go. Mm. Mexico, by road, by car, mm. motorcycle, bicycle, by foot. Any trip through Mexico is fraught with all sorts of perils. Right. Can I go what? By boat? I'm mm -hmm. also afraid that we might meet a storm out there. Can I go swimming? I, what I'm trying to yeah, establish yeah. is that when we look at the no side of things, we have to look at all the other options. And this is the, the, the point I want to make here, that, that, that there are dangers inherent with simply looking at the thing as yeah. a binary proposition. And, and what I want to propose is that maybe we should look at all the possible options that face us, some of them. Mm -hmm. Negotiate with Guatemala. Mm -hmm. Cooperate. Um, altercate, meaning, well, let's fight them. I don't know how mm -hmm. we will do that. Mm -hmm. um, then, of course, you have arbitrate and adjudicate, which is the proposal before us. And we also have procrastinate. And I think that last one, I think, has captured the attention of people because, again, people feel like, well, we have been able to... Kick the can down the road. ...to wait the thing yeah. out for 160 years. Why not 160 years? Well, why not another 160 years? But I say that what we need to do is look at mm. each of these options and look at the benefits and risks of each of these options. Um, and this is what I want to discuss, um, um, because what I'm saying would not an ICJ ruling. Let's say we got an ICJ ruling in our favor. Mm -hmm. Would not, that not help us to go back to the option of negotiating other things with them, like you said? Because now we have the upper hand. We have an ICJ ruling that says we have title to this land. So um, what I want to do is to ask you in your, as a, you have been involved in the process for how long? For about 25 years. 25 okay. years. So again, these options, what have been your experience with these options? And maybe there are other options. I mentioned. I think, I think at the end of the day, we need to first of all decide what it is we want to achieve. What is our end goal? Our end goal is to get this claim off our backs in order to secure the peace and security of Belize. Now, it is an unfinished business from the whole independence movement. We want to secure our borders. We got into independence without having that claim from Guatemala settled. And this is part of that unfinished business of the whole decolonization process. Okay. Now, you can look at it from the point of view of risks. Everything in life carries risks. You wake up in the morning, you get out of bed, there's a risk that you might slip and so forth. But then you have to measure those things. What is the risk of continuing to negotiate? The risk is that we will never be able to solve it. Why? Because Guatemala wants a piece of land and we will never give them a piece of land. Now, do we want to go back to the negotiating table? Then those who are proposing that option so, have to say, so you, what are we willing to give? So you're basically saying that negotiation at this point in time is off the table because Guatemala has reached a point where it is insisting that land must be a part of what's on the table? It's not, that, it's not just that they have reached the point, you know. They have always wanted land because their constitution provides that Guatemala has rights over so Belizean territory. So then what were we negotiating all this time? We were negotiating for them to be able to get the sense of what international law provides, get oh. to understand that Belize is a reality, that we exist, get to understand that the whole international community supports 
of our sovereignty and territorial integrity, and that they are alone in the world. And that is what the, that. The, the facilitation process was all about. Is, is, every, is that why every, these international every experts negotiating, were brought in? Every negotiating um, effort that has been conducted has ended up with Guatemala having to acknowledge Belize's rightful place in the world as a sovereign and independent country, and also for Guatemala to drop its claim along our border. What has been the problem with that? No leader in Guatemala has been able to sell that to their people. Why? Because their constitution prevents them from passing anything through Congress or anything through a referendum. The ones who have attempted to do so are now in the dustbin of history. But we knew this all the while. Well, we learned the hard way. We learned the hard way, and that's why the British told them from the beginning. In fact, when Lord Halifax in 1937 wrote to the Guatemalans and said, let's go to court, he said, look, if we continue negotiating, we'll be negotiating forevermore, and we'll never be able to find a solution, because this is a legal problem. You say the treaty is says something, and we say that is not what the treaty says. Okay, so... <laughs> so we have gone back full circle. Okay, we have so tried everything else. Well, I myself books. misunderstood what the negotiation was about. You are saying that the negotiation was about convincing them of our position, yes. of our in legal turn, position to title. In turn, they were trying to convince us that we ought to give them a piece of our land. Oh. It's, it's, My thinking all the while is that what we were trying to do is say, okay, you want land because you want access to the seas, you want to enjoy some of what we have. So we were trying to negotiate ways of them having access to the sea we, and we, enjoying some of our resources without actually owning it. We tried every creative way around the, um, the, 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 the problem. The problem is that their constitution requires or provides that they have rights over Belize's territory. Now, some Guatemalan leaders have been insightful enough and enlightened enough to, say, to, to, to know that there is no way they will get any land from Belize. And so we have looked at the possibility of getting access to the sea. We have looked at the possibility of them getting development concessions. We have looked okay. at the possibility of getting joint exploration zones and so forth. Pipelines, all kind of things have been discussed none of them have been able to reach us, to take us to a rightful conclusion. So when we got those legal opinions from the um, international jurists, so, right. um, I think in 1978 and again in 2001. Mm -hmm. They, they bore it and a lot of pact and the, right. and the um, Sorelli. And the it, purpose it. of getting those was to help to convince them of the position we were taking to show them we have title, is that? To, you know, to solidify, because you know, you have, even here in Belize, you hear the arguments, well, those opinions are old, so we need to update them. And international law has developed in such a way that it has further strengthened our position. So, for example, when the British, when the Guatemalans tore up the 1859 treaty in the 1945, the British told them, we have to go to court. The ICJ was formed in 1945. The first letter that went to the ICJ a dispute for, for dispute settlement was from the British on the question of Belize's territory. Guatemalans said no. The Guatemalans sought a legal opinion from Judge Manley Hudson, used right. to be a judge at the Permanent Court of International Justice. And Judge Hudson, one of the highest rate jurist of his time, gave an opinion to Guatemala and said, Guatemala, you stand no possibility of getting any land from Belize if you go to the ICG or if you settle it on the basis of international law. They ignored that. Kept on insisting that Belize is no true. So it's not that they have always been reasonable. It's not that they have always been um, trying to find an option that will be suitable to us. You ha they, they have for many years been led by some leaders that took advantage of the problem that exists between Belize and Guatemala. And importantly, what you're saying is that all this while, 
we have been trying to convince them of our position. That's right. Between the two parties without having to resort to going to an international court or arbitration or something like that. That's right. And facilitation um, by getting in what international experts were these, these people Everything, also you know, you know, You know Article 33 of the Charter of the United Nations provides a menu of options what countries should do when they have a dispute between them. And the menu is very clear. Negotiation, conciliation, mediation, facilitation, resort to regional agencies, arbitration, judicial settlement. Now, if you look at that list. Right. Those are the options we, we are talking about. Those are the peaceful, peaceful processes of dispute settlement. It's in the Charter of the United Nations, Article 33. And we tried all of them. Every one of them we have ticked. And then it says, because people And probably say, multiple times too. Multiple times, for years, decades we've been negotiating. The, 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 people say go to the Security Council because the Security Council is charged with maintaining peace in the world. Well, the same article of the Charter provides that the Security Council shall take into consideration those options. What options? The same options are listed. Right. Yeah? And then it says further at Article 36 of that same chapter, it says the Security Council should bear in mind that legal disputes should, as a general rule, be submitted to the International Court of right. Justice. But Ambassador, what is important, the salient point brought out here, is that we have complied with um, international best practices in terms of trying to come to a peaceful solution to the dispute. You know, you know, John, throughout history, I am proud to say, and I think every Belizean should be proud to say, that we have kept the moral high ground when it comes to doing the right thing in the world. Okay. So in the eyes of the international community, the Belize has been doing all the right things, following every provision of the United Nations Charter. We are seen as the, as the ones who have been seeking peace, security, and that's why we enjoy the support of the United right. Nations. But importantly, Belizeans want to know that we have tried all the options available. That we, is, we that is the key thing. every single one of them. On that point, Some of them multiple times. On that point, um, we'll go to break. And when we come back, we'll be joined by Ambassador Dylan Vernon via Skype. Belizeans have been asking, can Belize lose territory at the ICJ? Based on international law and the supportive evidence in our possession, Belize has perfect title to all of our territories. The Guatemalan claim to Belizean territory is not supported with convincing legal evidence, and so the entire claim is without merit and would be regarded as such by the ICJ. Be informed. Visit our website or social media pages. On April 10th, 2019, Belizeans will determine whether the dispute arising from Guatemala's claim should be settled at the International Court of Justice, the ICJ. Know the facts. Our boundaries with Guatemala were established in the Convention of 1859 between Britain and Guatemala. But problems arose in the 1930s about the meaning of Article 7 of that convention. The British proposed that they take their differences to the World Court to settle the problem peacefully in accordance with international law. But Guatemala refused and instead laid claim to Belize's territory. From the 1960s, every government has been making efforts to settle peacefully Guatemala's unfounded claim. But all those previous attempts failed. We now have a chance to settle it finally and peacefully at the ICJ. Are Belizeans willing to stand up for our good title to Belize's land and sea in court? And to demand that the ICJ tell Guatemala, leave Belize alone? Register to vote, be informed, and on 10th April 2019, you decide.
Welcome back, um, TV and radio listeners and viewers. Um, we will now be joined by um, Ambassador Dylan Vernon. He is ambassador to the EU, posted um, in Brussels, but he's currently Skyping from Belize City. Ambassador Vernon is um, ambassador, as I said, uh, of Belize to the European Union and the Kingdom of Belgium. Before joining Belize's diplomatic corps, his career included directing the Society for the Promotion of Education and Research, otherwise known as SPEAR, and managing the Belize UNDP office, lecturing at the University of Belize, and chairing the Political Reform Commission. Significantly, he was the chairperson of the Advisory Council on the Guatemala Claim from 2006 to 2009 and a member of the National Advisory Commission on Relations with Guatemala before that. Currently, Ambassador Vernon is assigned to the public awareness campaign being conducted by the Referendum Unit of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So, Ambassador Vernon, um, welcome again to um, the show. Um, you're joined by your colleague, Ambassador Rosado. And uh, we want to continue um, the conversation along the lines that we left off, because obviously Ambassador Vernon has been in the trenches, but in an advisory capacity. Um, you have actually been at the table with Guatemala. Yes, for many yes. years. Uh, and Ambassador Vernon has been advising the commission. Ambassador, um, are you there? Yes, yes. Good so, evening, uh, uh, John and Ambassador Rosado. It's good to join you on interesting conversation so far. Yes, um, I, I, I was indeed, I think, most relevant, the, the chair of um, the Advisory Council on the Guatemalan Claim from 2005 to 2009, that critical period of the last attempt at negotiation, which failed, that then led to the judicial option that uh, we now are considering today. Um, one of the things I, that Ambassador Rosado said that I think is important is that we did not arrive at this moment in history overnight. It's the collective important. efforts of both the PUP and UDP administrations, actually since independence, but especially since 2005, because there was a, an agreement in 2005, the, the confidence building measures, in which uh, it was basically agreed that um, if the negotiations failed, that began in 2005, that the OAS Secretary General could recommend could recommend a judicial option, having exhausted negotiations and facilitation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That is exactly as we know what happened in 2007. The negotiations failed, and uh, they when, failed for the I'm very. Sorry, can I can I um, interject here? Yes. When you say the negotiations failed, what does that mean? The negotiations failed for the simple fact that Guatemala continued to want something we could never give, uh, territory or rights. And uh, in this case, the negotiations were actually looking at maritime areas uh, initially, and uh, it came obvious to the negotiators that you cannot negotiate maritime areas if you don't have consensus on territorial boundaries. And Guatemala refused to, to recognize that. So we ended up with a failed negotiation. And when those failed, that is when the ICJ option came on the table and the OAS recommended it. Um, both so governments importantly, it was, it was never looked at before as, as an option. We were, we were trying to resolve the matter through the other Correct. options that you discussed. Well, and, and, and since independence, since independence, because the British before independence in, in the in the 1940s, the 50s, uh, had an option that they placed to Guatemala to, to look at a judicial option. And uh, Guatemala never took up that opportunity then. But post-independence, which is when Belize, in a sense, inherited this claim, is, is the most important phase for us in terms of the negotiations and our involvement as 
an independent country in the negotiations. Uh, and so it was uh, in 2007 that it broke down, and that is what led uh, to uh, both countries negotiating a special agreement uh, in uh, 2008. And I can tell you that um, because I was the chair of the advisory council on the Guatemalan claimant, understand that this council is actually was actually um, broad based, 30 different uh, individuals representing all sectors of Belizean society, uh, the bar association, churches, unions, business sector, indigenous groups, um, all receiving uh, from the negotiating team. Uh, they, they, after the um, February 2008 election, the lead negotiator was the late uh, Ambassador Fred Martinez. And we received blow by blow what was happening in the negotiation of the special agreement at the time. And so uh, the advisory council was consulted and uh, had uh, many questions, as uh, you would imagine, about it. And we were satisfied at the end that the, the special agreement, um, as advised by our legal team, <clears throat> But you, was, you, are, um, you, you are fast forwarding a bit from where I would like to be at the moment uh, to the special yeah. agreement, because the special agreement is the precursor to um, April 10th, I am trying to establish um, the different actions we took to resolve mm -hmm. the dispute before adjudication was considered as an option. And uh, we spoke at length with Ambassador Rosado on, on, what those, on what actions were taken. You were involved in the process from when? From, well, from, from 2000 or even before? From 2000, uh, there was a, a National Advisory Commission. Okay, and so I represented at that time the NGO community um, on that advisory commission. But so at I was, that time, we were still actually trying to negotiate with them. Yes, the, the 2000 uh, National, National Advisory Commission, commission to 2003 or so, that focused on advising when the facilitation process happened. This was a, a negotiation through facilitation by the OAS. And, and by facilitation, what do you mean, Ambassador? What was involved it, in facilitation? It, it, it meant that both Guatemala and Belize appointed a facilitator to assist us to present our cases to each other. This was always and, an international expert or someone of that caliber? Yeah, it, it was uh, Sir Sridhar Rangfal for Belize and right. uh, yeah, a lawyer Paul uh, Riker for Guatemala. And, and their role was basically to say, okay, talking face to face um, has failed. Uh, perhaps we, as facilitators, through the good office of the OAS, can assist you to come up with a, a solution. They actually presented proposals um, as to uh, how the dispute could be settled. And um, these were presented um, to the Belizean people and the Guatemalan people also on their side uh, in uh, 2002, uh, September, if I remember. And uh, the Belize government accepted them, and we were supposed to go to a referendum. Remember, uh, in uh, I think it was 2003, if I'm not mistaken, Ambassador Rosado, to, uh, to have the uh, facilitator's proposals accepted in both countries simultaneously. But Guatemala pulled out, um, uh, as they always have done whenever we get near to an agreement. And um, we weren't able to uh, have a referendum on the facilitator's proposals. So that failed. And that's one of the things that failed. Um, if you go back to before independence, mediation was tried, that failed. Hundreds of times of meetings, uh, hours spent in negotiations between the two countries. And then the facilitation process failed. And uh, so we got then in a logical aggressive way to the judicial option. Okay, so maybe you, you, you made an important point there. You said that when you reached a certain juncture in the negotiations, when you felt that maybe you were probably going to finally, you know, get over the hurdle, Guatemala pulled out. And you distinctly yes. said, as they always do. And I think this is also part of the problem that people face, because now we are basically down to the adjudication option, um, binding um, judicial settlement via the ICJ. 
And the question is, the ICJ pronounces in favor of Belize. Well, can Guatemala pull out again, so to speak? Ambassador? Well, can I say first, before we move on to that, to yes. that point, it's important to understand why negotiations fail. I know I've, it's easy for some people to say, we didn't have good negotiators. I think what we need to bear in mind is that our negotiators were able to ensure that Belize's sovereignty and territorial integrity remains intact throughout those negotiations. Guatemala would have probably been satisfied if we gave them a part of our territory, none of which any of Belize's negotiating team was ever willing to do, which is why negotiations will continue failing Just if, in. If, if we proceed in that Did direction. any of the facilitators or mediators ever encourage that? You know, you know, you know the interesting or... thing, the interesting thing, if you go back to the history of these negotiations or processes to settle it, going back to the mediation of the Webster proposals, right. even that would have maintained our boundaries, even though it had some, some very offensive proposals, such as we would be an associate state of Guatemala, but the boundaries would not change. The heads of agreement would never have changed the boundary. And then we went on to the Roatan proposals and facility. None of them, none of the proposals that we ever arrived at or that was ever arrived at included a change in our, of our boundaries. None. Now they had many other elements that were, were unacceptable, unacceptable to Belize and even to Guatemala. So that um, we were never able to... Um, to proceed with any of the proposals that were made. But the important point is that the negotiations failed because Belize was never willing and able. I don't think any politician, even if they wanted to, would be able to finalize an agreement by which they would be giving any piece of land or any piece of territory to Guatemala. And that's why we're here. That is why we're here. It's not because the negotiators were not able they were very able negotiators. In fact, we had among the best, George Price, to begin with. When we had self-government, he was involved in this thing. And when the British were negotiating and were even willing to contemplate the possibility of surrendering something to Guatemala, we said no. Belize kept saying no. And up to today, we will say not a square centimeter, not yeah. a blade of grass. And what do you make of this point? I guess this is really looking at things very practically, that the reason that we are in this position is because we cannot stand up militarily to Guatemala. Guatemala wouldn't dare try this with, say, Mexico. Is, I mean, is well, really, well, 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 practically, is that why an Ambassador Vernon, you can win? Is, is that really maybe why we are here? Well, that is one reason why we're here, among many others. But, but clearly, for example, we have the problem in the SARS too. I know many Belizeans are offended by it. Um, and we, as we rightly should be, none of us likes the idea that uh, 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 a neighbor would try to bully us in any part of our territory. But that's what they're doing. It's offensive. And yes, they are trying to push their weight in the SARS too. And they would love for the world, and especially for Belizeans to think that Belize and so basically no what you're saying, we court. have to rely on an international court of justice. We have to rely on the principles of international law, including international law, because that is what we have been relying on ever since. That is the source, the foundation of our independence and our existence as a country. Without international law, without the principles that underpin the United Nations system, Belize will not exist as we do today. And that's why we have to keep our faith in that system, which allowed us to be free as an independent country. On that point, what we'll have to do is quickly ask Ambassador Vernon to weigh in on what you have said, because I think we have run out of time. And <laughs> understanding we have well, run out of time. I don't think I can add very much except to say that the key thing is that we have a neighbor no matter what we have tried, 
who has failed and refuses to recognize our borders as we say they are. That has created uncertainty on the border when we have these in incursions and illegal uh, activities. The SARS-2 is the best example. It costs us in, in, in an environmental cost and diplomatic cost. Politically, it divides us. This is something that we are saying. And the uh, opportunity it, cost, if I may add, the opportunity, well, the opportunity cost of having this settled and the, 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 the whole um, op the opportunities that will arise from having... But the final point I want to make... Before I yes, commerce and so on. Exactly. Yes. The final I point I want to make before I close off, I know you're running out of time, is this, that um, another part of why uh, some are saying, including our government, that this is uh, an urgent moment, is because for the first time in history, we have Guatemala having voted yes, agreeing to go to court on legal merits. And we are very sure having of that, our position. Having that moment reoccur in the future, uh, some are saying if we don't take it, it will be hard to replicate. So you're Leaders saying the, the stars politics. have aligned for Belize, that's what you're saying. Because what we saying have always been sure of our legal position and now finally they have agreed to settle the matter on the basis yes. of and, and it, it's, 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 a, it's a moment that we have arrived at on a long road and it's a moment that might be difficult to replicate in the future. Uh, it is one that um, I think that should be put in the, the many uh, considerations that people have as they make up their minds. Ambassador, that's... Um most important point and on that note ambassador rosado and ambassador vernon we want to thank you all for being on the show tonight um thank you um thank at you. the end again the point i was making that it's it's not simply yes or no to the icj i think this the discussion tonight has shown that the question is is there another option or way other than going to the ICJ. Having looked and, 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 and worked um, and having tried to, you know, to come to a meeting of the minds with Guatemala in all these other areas, we have not been able to do so. And so basically what you're saying is that we have ended up here because we have already looked at everything. And Ambassador Vernon is actually saying that it is also an important moment for us because we have always contended that we have a firm legal position and Guatemala has finally decided we're going to court on the basis of that. Your, Your entire, final words. You're entirely right. I think other people have been pro proposing other options which really would not settle the problem, like for example, going for an advisor opinion, which is not binding, and which would not settle up. The, 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 it does not settle. Advisor opinions would not settle disputes between countries. Others say put more BDF on the ground. We have been putting more law enforcement around in the ground, but that will not settle the problem. The other options that are being proposed will not settle the problem. And what we're looking at is a final settlement of this age-old dispute. Thank you, and viewers, thank you for tuning in to our first episode of Let's Talk. I encourage all of you to continue having these discussions without the shouting, without the disrespecting, and without any animosity. Good night.